Welcome to Feminist Question Time, brought to you by Women's Declaration International, the leading global organisation defending women's sex-based rights against the threats posed by gender identity ideology. There's more information on the website womensdeclaration.com, where you will find our Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights, which has been signed by 32,393 people from 159 countries and is supported by 454 organisations from all over the globe. We have over 100 volunteer activists and 53 country contacts engaged in defending women's rights. This week, I'm delighted to say we have Helen Steele from the UK. She is going to, her, the title of her talk is Deep Deception, the story of the Spy Cops Network. We also have Lier Keith from the USA, who will talk about security culture. And then we're going to hear from Anna Kerr from Australia, Are Women Being Watched? Before we start, I'm going to show you some photos. This is a series of UK Home Office surveillance photos. So they are um, available to see in the Museum of London. And the British Home Office, that's the part of the British government, the state, um, took these photos of suffragettes commissioned by the Home Office from 1913. They were taken, many of them were taken in the exercise yard of the prison where numerous suffragettes, including the figurehead, Emmeline Pankhurst, was in, incarcerated. Um, these photos were used to identify militant suffragettes attempting to enter public buildings such as museums and art galleries. So this is one photo of uh, Grace Marson, uh, alias Frida Graham, um, at, at when she was a suffragette prisoner. So it's a, a sort of the state surveying, taking images of women and watching the women's movement. This is another photo taken by the British state of the women's movement, surveillance photo of suffragette prisoners taking exercise in the yard of Holloway Prison, taken by an undercover photographer working for the Home Office. And if you can get to London, um, these are in the Museum of London. And then here's another surveillance photograph of Mary Richardson in about 1914. She's on the left. And then on the right, Suffragette Gibson taking exercise at the Yard of Holloway Prison. So Helen Steele is our first speaker. And Helen Steele recently has written a book with four other women. And the book is called Deep Deception. And this is a copy of the book. It is massively recommended. It's a fantastic book. It details their experiences of being deceived into intimate sexual relationships by undercover police officers who were spying on political movements in the UK and how they and three other women launched a groundbreaking case against the police to expose and seek to stop serious human rights abuses being committed by the police. In 2015, the women received an unprecedented apology from the police for these abuses. Helen became politically active as a teenager, campaigning on a range of environmental and social justice issues, including feminism. In the 1990s, she fought a high profile court case with Dave Morris after being sued for libel by McDonald's Corporation over a crit leaflet criticizing the company. The Mac libel trial became the longest trial in English legal history. The legal battle finally ended in 2005 with a ruling from the European Court of Human Rights that the trial had breached Helen and Dave's right to freedom of expression and a fair trial. In 2017, after Helen stepped in to stop the harassment of two women distributing feminist leaflets at the London Anarchist Book Fair, Helen was surrounded by trans activists who demanded she leave and shouted abuse at her for over an hour. Since that time, Helen has been kicked out of other events and has been ostracized by many former friends and colleagues for challenging the sexism of gender identity politics. Over to you, Helen, and welcome. I was going to start by talking about my experiences being deceived into a, a two year relationship with an undercover policeman. Uh, who I knew as John Barker, but whose real name was John Dines. 
Um, then I'll talk a bit about the process of finding out the truth about who he was and then taking legal action uh, with other women against the police to try and stop these abusive relationships from happening again. Um, through that process and through sharing our experiences of the deceit by these men, we came to recognise what we had assumed were um, individual actions and behaviours by the officers actually demonstrated patterns that could only have come from um, some kind of training and institutional sexism. Um, after that, I'll talk a little bit about the public inquiry into undercover policing, which is now underway, uh, in, including some of the information that has emerged from that about police spying on feminist groups and campaigns over the last five decades. Um, and just really, it's good to be alert to the possibility that any campaign that you're involved with could be infiltrated either by the police or by private companies. Um, just to note that uh, in the McLeibel case, um, uh, some of the evidence in that case uh, was um, obtained by private detectives in uh, infiltrating the group or by journalists, um, all of whom may seek to undermine or redirect your campaigns to stop you achieving your aims. Um, so while it's important to be aware of the fact that you, you could be infiltrated, it's also important not to let the fear of infiltration stop you from taking action, um, because that's exactly what they want you to do. They want you to be uh, frightened to, to, to try and achieve anything. And if we, if we don't try, we definitely won't achieve anything. So <laughs> I became politically active as a teenager in the 1980s, uh, initially campaigning for animal rights and environmental sustainability, and then um, also against war, sexism, racism, and other forms of oppression and exploitation. In 1987, I started attending the meetings of London Greenpeace, which was a, a broadly environmental and anti-capitalist group, which held protests in the city of London against the arms trade, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund. And it was also the group that initiated the very popular worldwide anti-McDonald's campaign, which led to the McLeibel case that Joe mentioned that I fought. Um, at this group, I met John, um, who was the un who turned out to be the undercover policeman he had a van and he used to off to drive people home which is actually a very common tactic of undercover agents because it means that they can find out where people live i was usually the last to to be dropped off um, and so we'd end up chatting about our our backgrounds as well as our politics um, i'd known john for about three years before we started a relationship uh, and in that time, he'd become quite a close friend, sharing lots of his stories about personal issues like the death of his parents, being an only child, losing all his possessions when his van was stolen shortly after he moved to the UK. Um, he asked me out several times and eventually we ended up in a relationship not long after he had told me that his mum had died and he needed to borrow money to get to New Zealand for the funeral. In reality, his mum was still alive and so was his dad. And he also had brothers and sisters. So all of those stories that he told me, um, seeking my empathy and involvement in his life were, well, they were totally false and they were obviously a deliberate process of emotional manipulation. Um, we ended up moving in together. Uh, he told me that he wanted to have children with me and he wanted to spend the rest of his life with me. Um, then after a short period of kind of bliss, um, he appeared to be going through some sort of mental breakdown and he then disappeared from my life, leaving me bereft and also extremely concerned for his well-being. Um, I searched for him, but I kept hitting brick walls and everything I investigated turned out to be false. Uh, Eventually, in the course of that search, I discovered that he'd actually been using the identity of a child who died aged eight. Um, and at that point, my life really fell apart. Um, you know, if the person who I thought I knew and trusted the most could turn out to be fake and I didn't even know his name, how could I trust anyone else around me or even trust my own judgment? Um, I continued searching and eventually discovered his marriage certificate and he'd actually been married at the time we were in a relationship. Um, I tried to raise the alarm with a, a few people who I felt I could trust, but um, they 
they suggested, especially my dad suggested, that there were probably less exciting reasons for his deceit than being a police spy um, and, and that that wouldn't happen in this country. Um, and he seemed to suggest that I was become becoming paranoid. Um, despite trying to continue with my investigations to, to kind of prove um, that he'd been an undercover policeman, the trail went cold and I couldn't find out the truth. Um, and yeah, I kind of eventually gave up really. Um, it wasn't until 2010 that I finally gained confirmation that my ex-partner had been an undercover policeman. Um, I was contacted by another woman who had also been deceived into a relationship by a different undercover officer. Um, he had also disappeared, but she'd succeeded in tracking him down. Unfortunately for her, that success then led to a second round of deceit and she ended up having two children with him before escaping to a domestic violence refuge. And then eventually she was able to get a message to me to tell me the truth about my ex-partner. Um, around this time, another woman um, called Lisa had investigated her partner, Mark Stone, um, and he was then exposed as a police spy named Mark Kennedy, who had infiltrated environmental groups for about seven years. When this story broke in the media, uh, Kennedy was portrayed by the police as a rogue officer who'd gone off the rails. Um, but, but by then I was aware of uh, four more officers who had abused women in this way. And I felt it was important um, that we take action to expose it by taking legal action against the police um, and trying to prevent it from happening to other women. We sought advice from lawyers and in um, 2011, eight of us got together to sue the Metropolitan Police represented by Harriet Wistrich, who now works at the Centre for Women's Justice and indeed helped set it up. Um, our case involved eight women deceived by five different undercover officers um, and the, with the, all the relationships together spanning a period of about 25 years, which demonstrated that it was, um, you know, systemic well, it demonstrated the systemic nature of the abuse, that it wasn't just individual officers to blame. Um, through coming together and discussing our experiences, we discovered that what had seemed like individual sob stories and emotional outbursts from the men were repeated patterns of behaviour that could only have come through a training programme. Um, and to us, this highlighted the lengths the state was prepared to go to to prevent change and um, it represented institutional sexism that, that, you know, they could think it was OK to abuse women and derail our lives just to shore up the fake identities of these undercover policemen. Um, we fought, fought with the case uh, repeated. We had repeated applications by the police to have our case thrown out of court. Um, but eventually, in 2015, the police were um, forced to pay us damages and to make an unprecedented apology in which they admitted that the relationships were a gross violation of our rights and amounted to serious human rights abuses. Um, I think the link will be posted to the police apology, which is actually well worth a, a listen. It's really quite, um, you know, it's really quite shocking. Our book goes into much more detail about um, the relationships and also about fighting the case and, and trying to expose um, this scandal. Moving on to the public inquiry into public into undercover policing, um, in 2014 the Home Secretary announced a public inquiry into undercover policing to investigate the actions of, of these secret political police units uh, which included um, the abusive undercover relationships that we had exposed. And it also um, was to look into the revelations by the police whistleblower, um, Pete Francis, that the police had spied on the grieving family and friends of, of the murdered teenager, black teenager, Stephen Lawrence, um, rather than investigating the racist murderers. Um, the inquiry opened in 2015, but it actually only started hearing evidence in 2020. It's been beset by delays caused by police demands for secrecy. But what we do know is now know is that over 1000 groups were spied on in the UK. 
Um, the inquiry has so far refused to name most of them, but we do know that the vast majority were left-wing groups. There were only a handful of right-wing groups. And we do know that um, uh, they include, the groups spied on include women's groups, as well as trade unions, anti-racist campaigns, family justice campaigns, peace campaigns, and environmental groups. Campaigners have been fighting for the release of the cover names used by the officers. Um, despite, despite this, the inquiry has released less than half the cover names, um, but without the cover names being disclosed, that means um, the people spied on can't give evidence um, to the inquiry about what the officers did, so it can't really get a true picture of what happened. Um, and it also means that other women won't also be able to find out that they were deceived by these officers. <clears throat> When we started our case, uh, there were eight women involved and we knew of a handful more. Um, but now with further research by campaigners and the release of some of the cover names uh, of officers by the public inquiry, we know that more than 50 women um, have been deceived into relationships by undercover police officers in these secret political policing units. On the Police Spies Out of Lives website, there is actually a link to um, a timeline of all the officers who had relationships with women. The first officers gave evidence in November 2020 about their deployments and um, more recently in May this year uh, more senior officers have given evidence um, you know about about their management of the units. In the main they have all been fairly evasive about who knew what about the relationships. Managers did give evidence that it was considered essential for undercover officers to have what they called stability and anchor. Um, and so almost all of the, the officers were married men, which in theory gave them something to come back to and was supposed to prevent them from temptation. Um, but uh, really there's, um, you know, I mean, through our case and through the evidence in the inquiry, there's some really shocking evidence um, of, of institutional misogyny. Uh, one officer in particular gave um, a shocking response that he said, I have, if you like, a phrase in my head which helps guide me here. This is in relation to whether officers um, should have relationships with women undercover. I have, if you like, a phrase in my head which helps guide me here. If you ask me to infiltrate some drug dealers, you can't point the finger at me if I sample the product. If these people in a, are in a certain environment where it's necessary to engage a little more deeply, then shall I say, shall we say, I find this acceptable. Basically, they're comparing um, deceiving women into sex and relationships with, with sampling a drug. Um, Perhaps realising that he dropped a clangor, he went on to say that he did worry about the consequences for the female and any children that may result from the relationships. These units were recording a great volume of information about people that they were spying on. Um, it, you know, uh, some seriously personal information, um, just to give the first uh, example. It, it reports that since that time, she has been unattached until recently when she formed a relationship with a bus conductor on the and the number of the bus is redacted um, called and it gives uh, his name but that's redacted for privacy reason and it says that he's a black belt karate exponent um, and she says and the report goes on to say and it is likely that this liaison will blossom although the two characters prefer at present to maintain their independence however she still lives at and then her address is redacted, and in the last week has intimated that she wishes to fall pregnant again, and for this purpose has ceased to take the pill on a regular basis. She is, however, not quite sure at the present as to who will sire this latest socialist offspring. So you can see there just really um, shockingly intrusive information recorded about um, a woman just because they're spying on the group. So to, to kind of move on to the, the um, spying that we're aware of so far on the women's liberation movement. So far, the inquiry has only heard evidence relating to the period between 1968 and 1982. 
Um, but as part of that, we've had disclosed a special, some special branch reports, including um, the special branch report for number for 1971. A number of the groups that were reported on us at this point in time, the, the uh, special demonstration squad was actually called the special operations squad, which you'll see from the initials SOS at the top. And then at the bottom of that list of groups being spied on, actually, it's the penultimate one. There are more on another page. I couldn't fit them all on. But you'll see the Women's Liberation Front appears there. This reports here um, that um, the current strength of the Special Operations Squad, uh, and then it includes two women detective constables, um, and it talks, and then in the second paragraph, it talks about um, having been established for a little over three years and providing intelligence on demonstrations and so-called extremist organisations, together with general information about persons and groups who have participated or are likely to participate in these activities. It says that the um, the arrival of a second woman officer has added considerably to the squad's flexibility and has proved invaluable in the comparatively recent field of women's liberation. Um, so this seems to be when they started reporting on the women's liberation movement. Um, we've, heard we've heard evidence at the inquiry from an undercover officer called Sandra Davis that she was recruited to infiltrate the Women's Liberation Front between 1971 and 1973. She attended the weekly meetings held in campaigners' private homes that were attended by about 10 people. And as she gained trust, um, she became the treasurer of the group's main committee, whose meetings were also held in private homes and attended only by around five people. Despite this, she continued to spy on the group for over two years. Sandra said she was recruited to the Special Demonstration Squad by Peter Imbert, who was at that point in time the head of the Metropolitan Police Special Branch, but who then went on to become the Metropolitan Police Commissioner in the 1980s. Um, Sandra said that, quote, women liberation, women's liberation was viewed as a worrying trend at the time. There was a very different view towards the women's movement then as compared to today. She gave evidence that at the time, the Women's Liberation Front mainly campaigned for equal pay, free contraception and free nurseries. She said that as a constable, she had the same powers and responsibilities as her male colleagues, but as a female officer, she was only paid 90% of the men's salary. It's really quite incredible that she's doing her bit to undermine uh, the campaign for equal pay. Um, she reported on the Women's Liberation Front on, on such kind of mundane things as supplying homemade sweets and cakes for a children's Christmas party organised by the Black Unity and Freedom Party. She also reported on the Women's Liberation Front holding a jumble sale. And both of these reports were copied to MI5. Um, the, part, the inquiry has revealed that a lot of this, uh, the intelligence gained was actually um, passed on to MI5. And that's actually recorded in the side of some of the documents where it refers to um, Box 500, which was the code name for MI5. Um, Sandra also infiltrated women's rights conferences across the country, recording all sorts of things from their debates. Um, there's an example of um, the Women's Liberation Co um, Conference in Derbyshire in November 1971. Um, these are actually lengthy reports that can be um, read in, in, in their total, in their entirety on the Undercover Policing website. Um, you, you, you need to do a search for um, women's liberation or, or look for some, the evidence of Sandra Davies, um, and they should be listed under that. Here she reports on um, the uh, Women's Liberation Conference in Guildford in Surrey, in June 1972, uh, where she records that um, they were a group of fairly moderate women with no particular political motivation who have recently been campaigning for nurseries in the Guildford area. You know, it's really quite, <laughs> quite a shocking, shocking thing to be reporting on. This is in November 1972. Uh, she's attending the National Women's Liberation Conference in London. And here she reports to her superiors, quotes, 
lesbian friends in particular made exaggerated and noisy displays of affection, openly kissing and hugging each other. These displays were commonplace throughout the conference and it was not unusual to see two girls entwined in a corner. That little notice was taken by the majority of the women present indicated the prevailing liberal attitude. Um, it is, it is, I don't know, I find it quite, quite astounding that all this is getting reported. There's another uh, entertaining bit in, in the eighth slide um, that talks about, um, actually it's towards, towards the end of that bit, it says men were regarded as unnecessary and um, then it says about test tube babies being reviewed as the future means of reproduction. But, um, and just uh, as something else I spotted only today, I'd missed this before. If you go to slide nine, it talks about uh, entertainments after the event and it talks about some films being shown. And then it said after this, the social commenced. It consisted of a record player which supplied the music and several kegs of beer and cider which supplied the mood. Several hundred women attended this function and although no men were allowed in, two transvestite men managed to gain entrance. Unfortunately, their presence was discovered and they were unceremoniously ejected amidst uproar. The social eventually ended at midnight. Um, anyway, Sandra basically told the inquiry, admitted to the inquiry that she did not um, think her work had really yielded any good intelligence. Um, although she, she claimed that it was beneficial in the sense that it helped her superiors conclude that the Women's Liberation Front didn't pose any threat to public order. Uh, she admitted that her deployment had failed to uncover any evidence of criminal activity, um, which is supposedly their motive for infiltrating these groups. Um, and she said she felt she could have been doing much more worthwhile things with her time. Um, other women's groups that we know uh, were infiltrated include um, Women's Voice, which was an organization and newspaper of socialist women, which started in the summer of 1972 and continued until 1982, uh, and which held meetings and rallies of up to 1,000 people. Uh, we know that the Greenham Common Women's Peace Camp was uh, infiltrated by um, a woman called Catherine Leslie or Lee Bonser, that's her pseudonym rather than her real name, um, between 1983 and 1987. Um, the public inquiry has said that this deployment is of significant interest to the inquiry because the group was um, non-violent and posed no serious threat to public order. Um, and it's also understood that another undercover officer infiltrated the Green and Women. Obviously, um, We've only got as far as 1982, and actually there's now a two-year delay until the next uh, round of evidence, which covers the period from 1982 to 1992, which won't start, the evidence in that won't start until 2024. Um, another group that we know was infiltrated was the Aldermaston Women's Peace Camp between 2002 and 2008, which was infiltrated by another officer called Lynn Watson, or well, that's a pseudonym again, who was working for this time a different unit set up in 2008 called the National Public Order Intelligence Unit. Um, the Women's Peace Camp were protesting against nuclear weapons, a nuclear weapons base at Aldermaston in Berkshire for many years and in 2004, Lynn Watson pretended to be a campaigner um, and made friends with the protesters. Um, evidence from these officers has not yet been heard, but there is actually some limited information about them on the public inquiry website in relation to their applications for um, anonymity. Just kind of moving up to sum up on, um, you know, the police tactics and so on. Um, political under police, undercover policing should be seen as part of a wider effort by those in power to control the way we think and to prevent the spread of alternative ideas, um, basically because they want to hang on to their power uh, and, and control. And, you know, for that reason, that's why they were spying on women. And that's why undoubtedly they will want intelligence on, on what the women's movement is doing now too. Um, so that it doesn't uh, challenge their power too much. Um, they 
they um, they act to well they do undermine um, opposition to the status quo by spreading um, dissent sorry by spreading division you know a lot of these officers would badmouth other campaigners and create divisions within groups um, or just the fact that um, you know if you were doing an occupation or something like that then um, you know if the police knew about it in advance uh, the occupation wouldn't be successful and then everyone would feel demoralized um, they they you know use information that they gain deeply personal information such as that recorded about the woman um, supposedly wanting to get pregnant and who she was in a relationship with they use that to create division but also to um, use in potential smear campaigns if you know if it suits their purposes um, and the whole purpose of this is to make everyone feel that change is impossible um, that you know there's no point in even trying um, but looking back through history uh, states have always tried to suppress movements for social change um, as we've seen uh, a few of the slides just now, but the first cameras that were bought by Special Branch in this country were actually used to create files on the suffragettes. We know that Nelson Mandela was labelled a terrorist and put in prison for um, fighting something so obviously wrong as apartheid, um, as were so many other people fighting racism, sexism and other injustices. Um, and it's important that everyone's aware of the efforts by the state and powerful institutions to undermine movements for social progress. Uh, so that we can learn how to resist those um, methods. But it's also important not to let our own fear or suspicion of others undermine our efforts too, because their purpose is to undermine and control dissent in order to um, keep the status quo. Um, and it's while it can be a hard battle to um, you know, resist the temptation not to be able to trust anyone. It is important that we try, otherwise we end up undermining ourselves and doing their jobs for them. Um, we can actually take heart from the fact in some ways that they infiltrate our campaigns because it shows that they, they know that um, we can and do have an effect when we communicate with each other about the change we want to see in the world. Those who hold power uh, continually put huge effort and resources into preventing change and it's it's important for us to continually organize to improve the world and and to fight fight for a more just and sustainable world um, and I think we can take heart from the fact that despite the efforts of the state to undermine previous campaigns such as the suffragettes and the anti-apartheid movement and the civil rights movement ultimately those uh, campaigns did achieve massive improvements, so we shouldn't feel defeated. There's more information um, on, there's three different websites, particularly, um, we set up a group, Police Spies Out of Lives, um, to support the women deceived into relationships. Um, and there's also the campaign opposing police, campaign opposing police surveillance, which uh, does reports about what's coming out at the public inquiry and the campaigns against um, the spying. And then there's Undercover Research Net, which has information about the individual officers and the campaigns that they were spying on. So all of those three sources are a good place to look for information, plus the public inquiry website as well, although that's a little bit difficult to get your head around. But anyway, the screenshots that were up are all from um, documents that have come out through the public inquiry. Um, a lot of it was the um, through the evidence of the, the policewoman, Sandra Davies, but some of it is just um, through other reports that have been disclosed that are not necessarily attributable to any witness. Um, there's probably going to be, there will be a gap now because there's no more evidence to be heard until um, 2024. Um, but there will be a lot more evidence about the women's liberation movement and, um, you know, other campaigns that were spied on coming out uh, over the coming years. Um, and it's if you were involved in the in any political movements um, between 1968 and 82, it's well worth looking on the inquiry website for, you know, what's up there already. Um, and then, you know, making contact if you think you were spied on with, um, you know, make contact with one of those groups. Right. So we're going to move on to our next speaker now, who is Lier Keith from the United States. Lier Keith is a prolific 
author, journalist. She has published many books, the latest of which is Bright Green Lies, How the Environmental Movement Lost Its Way and What Can We Do About It? Along with Derek Jensen and somebody I can't read the name Max of. Robert. And <laughs> thanks. Max Robert, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, she's uh, been involved with Deep Green Resistance and environmental movement for a very long time and is very knowledgeable and, um, you know, fantastic on that. She is also a founder uh, of Women's Liberation Front in the United States. And as of, well, for, for the last couple of years or may, maybe many years, has served as the chair of Women's Liberation Front, WOLF, which is uh, either the or one of the most significant feminist organizations in the States and is just does awesome work. We're gonna hear from Lier today. The title of her talk is Security Culture. And thank you so much for coming and speaking with us and to us, Leah, and over to you. The foundation of security culture was laid out in this anonymous pamphlet, um, what we call it a zine, back before the flood. Uh, it appeared in Canada sometime in the early 2000s, but it spread everywhere because the advice was so obviously sound. Now, as far as I know, the authors have never emerged from the shadows and I have no idea who wrote it to this day but um, they had this great definition. Uh, what is security culture? It's a culture where the people know their rights and more importantly, assert them. Those who belong to a security culture also know what behavior compromises security and they are quick to educate those people who out of ignorance, forgetfulness or personal weakness partake in insecure behavior. This security consciousness becomes a culture when the group as a whole makes security violations socially unacceptable in the group. So that's why it's not just a practice, but a culture. And these behaviors we hope become the norm. The people who wrote this pamphlet wanted these principles to become widely known and accepted to the point where they would be integrated into activist culture. Well, who needs security? Well, security is necessary for any group big enough to make trouble. Anytime you are effective, you may become a target for state intelligence gathering and repression. Infiltration is definitely a concern, but so is ubiquitous surveillance. This does not apply solely to people or groups considering illegal action. Nonviolent law-abiding groups have been and are surveilled and disrupted by COINTELPRO like entities. And COINTELPRO is a counterintelligence program that was um, a, a function of the United States government for oh, a good two, three decades. And you can read all about that um, if you know you want more information about the history of it. But when people say COINTELPRO, that's what that is. So many times it is the above ground resistors who are more at risk as working above ground means you're identifiable. So regardless of whether uh, they are above ground or below ground, any group which carries out effective resistance activity will be considered a threat by those in power and those in power will try to disrupt or destroy it. And what comes to mind this week is of course, what just happened to first Posey and then Harry Miller. Uh, resistance organizations can be divided into above ground and underground groups. Now these groups have strongly divergent organizational and operational needs, even uh, when they have the same goals. Broadly speaking, above ground groups do not carry out risky illegal actions and are organized in ways to maximize their ability to use public institutions and communications. The point of these groups is to build a movement. Underground groups exist primarily to carry out illegal or repressed activities and are organized in ways that maximize their own security and effectiveness. Some above ground groups do carry out illegal activities as part of campaigns of civil disobedience or they break or bend lesser laws as a means of causing disruption or confronting power. But as police become more draconian and punishments more severe, often those groups will split into an underground and above ground factions. There has to be a partition. This is absolute, a firewall between above ground and below ground activities. And that is the very first principle of security culture. And this point is crucial. Now, some historical groups have tried to sit on the fence and carry out both illegal activities and above ground activities without full separation. Such groups worked in places or times with far less surveillance than we are stuck with 
and their attempts to combine above ground and underground characteristics usually resulted in their destruction with severe consequences for their members. So in order to be as safe and effective as possible, every person in a resistance movement has to decide for herself whether to be above ground or underground. It is essential that this decision be made. Attempting to do, to do both is unsafe for everyone. So the differences between above ground and underground organizing are baked into the group structure and practice. So here's a handy chart uh, in terms of membership. The above ground groups have open membership and the members know each other. For an underground group, the membership is closed or it's very closely guarded, only very rarely letting new people in. And members are only aware of other people in the group, in the network on a need to know basis. In terms of public behavior, the above ground groups, they, they try to attract attention. Um, they conduct, everything is transparent for public relations. I mean, the goal is to build a movement so members can take an open stance for change and resistance. You can talk openly, you can lobby openly. If you're in an underground group, you're aiming for invisibility. Communication happens to the public only through anonymous communiques and members have to disguise themselves as outwardly apolitical or even conservative. For decision-making, above ground groups will have democratic, transparent and participatory decision-making for the underground, it, the decision-making has to be covert to outsiders. Nobody can know who the leaders are and it will be based on an internal rank structure. Uh, for internal communications, um, the above ground groups, the, there's open and very frequent communication between different groups and members can move easily between different groups. So you could join Standing for Women, and you could join uh, Women's Declaration, and you could join Extinction Rebellion, and you could join five more groups. And it's great to join as many things as you have time for, and that's not an issue. And you move around between groups and between protests and between trainings and everything cross pollinates, and that's great. And that's how the above ground is supposed to work. It's just, it's a very clear network. But for the underground, it's very different. Uh, communications between groups is extremely limited and would be done only in an encoded way. And there's movement between groups only when absolutely necessary. In terms of actions, above ground groups announce in advance and maximize their participation in media coverage. Again, you're trying to build a movement. Uh, and you, they may target areas where the enemy is strongest or most concentrated. So government offices or businesses for the underground is completely different. There's obviously no advance announcement and often the target is where the enemy is the weakest. That is not the only criteria for target selection, but it is one. Um, the goal ultimately for the above ground is to mobilize citizens or gain broader support to build even more political power. For the underground, you're not concerned with the support of the majority, uh, though you may want to increase the network of sympathizers and you do your best to avoid reprisals carried out on the general population. Um, and that can be, that's been a serious issue across history. So, all right. Um, so this is from directly from the pamphlet. It's like what not to say, this is sort of the basics of this. Um, you never want to talk about your involvement or someone else's involvement with an underground group. So for instance, I'm part of an underground radical feminist group. We're planning great stuff. That's not a statement you ever want to make if you're part of an underground group. Number two, you don't want to talk about someone else's desire to get involved with such a group. So Rachel said she wants to find a group doing cyber attacks against Pornhub. If Rachel has told you that, you need to tell Rachel not to tell you anymore. And you certainly don't wanna spread that around to anybody else. Uh, number three, asking others if they're a member of an underground group. Hey, are you part of that group doing cyber attacks on Pornhub? Um, not a question you ever wanna ask. Uh, you don't wanna talk about your or someone else's participation in any illegal action. Hey, I was part of that last cyber attack on Pornhub. Um, not, a, not a statement you wanna make. If you're doing that, you need to be quiet about it. This is how people get caught. Someone else's advocacy for such actions. So Rachel wants to plan a cyber attack on Pornhub. Again, you don't wanna say that. Rachel needs your protection. If she's telling you she needs to stop, 
And in the meantime, you need to protect her against herself. Nobody should be talking about the cyber attack on Pornhub. And then finally, you or someone else's plans for a future action. So Rachel and I are planning a huge cyber attack on Pornhub. Um, you don't want to tell people that you're going to be doing that. So that's the general issue. It's talking about specifics. So talking about particular people, particular groups, places, times, targets, events, anything that's specific is a very bad idea, even if it's a joke, if it's gossip, or if it's speculation. You can get people in serious trouble that way. Anyone doing underground action needs our solidarity and protection, and following these guidelines is the gift that keeps on giving. We can, however, talk about resistance or illegal activities in abstract or general terms. As the handbook states, it is perfectly legal, secure, and desirable that people speak out in support of monkey wrenching and all forms of resistance. So in the United States, we have the First Amendment. We are allowed to discuss ideas like political resistance, like political militants. It becomes illegal when you are actually planning to break the law. So secure versus insecure. Um, you are allowed to say, it is perfectly legal to say, I think we should increase our militancy against the porn industry. What's not secure? Would you join me in a cyber attack against Pornhub? It is perfectly secure and legal to say, the suffragettes use arson to win the vote and to have a discussion about that. What you shouldn't say is, I bet Lee or Keith would do arson against Pornhub. Um, it's perfectly legal and encouraged to say, could arson ever be a moral or useful tactic for feminists? We are allowed to have these discussions. It's perfectly legal. These are protected legally under the First Amendment and under uh, other kinds of arrangements you might have in other countries that protect free speech. This is generally okay to speak philosophically about these kinds of political tactics. And indeed, they are very necessary for political movements. But what you shouldn't say is, do you know anyone who's interested in burning down the adult video news headquarters? So again, you can speak very openly in general terms about moral and philosophical issues regarding political resistance. But what we don't wanna talk about is specifics, time, places, people. There are three exceptions to, to those six rules. Um, and these three and only three are the exceptions. The first is if you are planning an action with trusted members of your affinity group, your underground cell in a secure fashion, you are allowed to talk about it. Um, even within the affinity group, critical discussion and information should be restricted to those actually participating in an action. The takeaway phrase here is need to know. In good security culture, only people who need to know the critical information ever have access to it. The second exception, this occurs um, after someone has been arrested, tried and convicted. So it's already done, it's a done deal. They've probably been to prison, you know, they've made their best deal, whatever. But in that case, a person may speak about an action for which they've been convicted if she chooses to. But that individual has to be careful to avoid giving away information that would implicate other people or cause a hazard to people still working underground. So behave with caution. The third exception is anonymous letters and communiques to the media, but you have to be very careful. The transmission of the communique itself must be secure and anonymous. Um, and communiques have to be carefully vetted for identifying information. And that includes things like personal style, dialect, or other clues that could give, give away the game. So what to do with people who break security culture? Now security breaches, when they happen, occur for different reasons. Number one, people gossip, they speculate, and they do this because they're human. I mean, we're all gonna do this at some point. Uh, people brag, they lie about their in involvement, they'll hint heavily that they were involved with something because they get street cred, they get respect, or because they are impulsive, they're intoxicated, or they're just plain ignorant of security culture. Now, all of these behaviors are foolish, if not downright stupid and dangerous, so we have to know how to handle them. These security violations create rumors that can be passed on to listening informers or agents. And that's the reason really not to do it. You never know who's listening. People who do this in effect are unwitting informers. If you encounter these behaviors, the first response is to educate. 
People aren't born knowing about security culture and they simply may not have encountered good information or training. Make it clear in private and tactfully, but firmly that their actions are violating good security culture. Explain what they did, be specific about the behavior and explain why security culture is important and point them, point them toward further resources on the subject. Don't let violations pass or become a habit. This has to be ingrained in our culture. So chronic violators. Some people unfortunately are unable or unwilling to maintain good security culture and may become chronic violators. They may not be doing it on purpose. You might like them. They may be your friends, but they may also be acting as informers either willingly or unwittingly. The only effective way to deal with repeat violators is to cut them off from sources of information. This generally means asking them to leave your group to not attend meetings or organizing spaces. To allow them to remain as harsh as it may seem is to invite security breaches. It would be far harsher in the end to allow potential informers to stay and put activists at risk of potential prosecution. Counterintelligence agents in government and corporations have surveilled, infiltrated, and sabotaged even mainstream anti-war and environmental groups like Greenpeace, Above ground groups generally do not and should not have critical information that could end up putting people in jail if it got into the wrong hands, but it's not always clear cut. Infiltrators who train in quote, safe above ground groups can go on to do more destructive work, including acting as agent provocateurs in your own community. Those infiltrators can also gather information about who sympathizes with militant or radical causes and learn about social networks and relationships. They can decide which revealing offhand comments and suspicious activists should potentially be investigated. Anyone who likes to ask inappropriate questions or gossip about illegal activities will eventually spill information to those in power, either directly or by discussing it electronically where it can be easily surveilled. Conversely, people who brag or lie about illegal or underground activities or try to plan them with others in public can draw unnecessary and unwanted attention to any resistance group. So you really do have to just sometimes kick people out. People who cannot follow the basic rules of security culture are either deliberate informers or fundamentally unsuitable for serious resistance. Even though it may be painful or unpleasant, such people need to be separated from groups and places where serious resistance is taking place. Now implied in all of this is how destructive it is to accuse each other of being informants or agents. In serious resistance movements, such accusations get people killed. Paranoia is absolutely corrosive to trust and to relationships and accusations against innocent people will drive them out. I have seen up close and personal how ugly that can be. If we follow the guidelines of security culture, there is rarely any need to accuse someone of being an agent. What matters is the behavior. If we follow the guidelines of security culture, there is rarely any need to accuse someone of being an agent. What matters is the behavior. If someone is endangering others by asking inappropriate questions or otherwise breaking the protocols of security culture, you address the behavior. If that doesn't work, she is no longer welcome. Speculations and accusations are useless and destructive. Security culture means we don't have to engage in either. I wanted to just briefly mention the green scare in the United States. This is one part case study and one part cautionary tale. Um, this is how the FBI broke the back of the radical environmental movement in the United States. The FBI called it Operation Backfire. Uh, we called it the green scare. Um, the whole thing kicked off on December 7th, 2005. That was a long time ago. Uh, between 1995 and 2001, the Earth Liberation Front uh, did a series of actions that cost somewhere in the neighborhood of $48 million. Uh, the, the absolutely glorious one was of course, Vail, Colorado. If you're my age, you remember the day that this happened. Um, they were trying to build a ski resort on some of the last habitat for the endangered lynx in Colorado. This is literally a playground for rich people. And here's this creature, you know, hanging on by its last claw. And the ELF said no, and they burned this place to the ground. So this is the iconic photo that some of us sort of uh, grew up with. Um, 
And the estimated damage was $26 million. Now you can say what you want about the Earth Liberation Front. And I think there is much to discuss about militants in our various political movements. What I will always insist on pointing out is that they never hurt a single human being. They were incredibly cautious in what they did as scary and serious as arson is. They did try extremely hard to make sure that no humans were hurt as did the suffragists when they decided to escalate to arson. Um, but anyway, this was their most notorious crime and almost all of them went to jail. They had a level one design flaw. Um, one of the people in their cell was a heroin addict and they had managed to get away with all of this. It was four years later um, and this man, Jake Ferguson, who was indeed an addict. Uh, it was a very classic story. He had a broken taillight, was pulled over for a traffic violation. His car was searched, there was heroin. 15 minutes later, he was singing like a proverbial songbird. He turned in every last one of his friends and they sent him in with a wire uh, and he got them all. So uh, there's still one of them on the loose, Josephine Overraker, they never caught her. Um, of, of the 17 of them, she's the one who's still, still on the loose. So I'm just saying, if she ever bumps into these seminars and sees uh, this one in particular, Josephine, you still have supporters. I hope you're having a good life out there. Um, anyway, uh, some of them went to jail, about half of them flipped on each other. But there's a really good documentary that was made about this case. Uh, it's called If a Tree Falls. And if you ever wanna watch it, if you are curious about this, if you wanna understand what people did, how they got caught, why they get caught, why they were motivated to do these things, how movements become more militant and then less militant. It's a really great documentary and I will watch it with you because I, I knew I'm one degree removed from most of the people in that case. And it, there's a lot of detail that didn't make it into that film and it's stuff people should really know about. So, but I just want us to remember what we're here for. Uh, these are four endangered animals from the UK. That's the red squirrel, the turtle dove, the Scottish wildcat and the water vole. And the water vole is ratty from the wind in the willows, critically endangered. Find what you love, defend your beloved because even a broken heart is still made of love. Our um, third speaker and final speaker is Anna Kerr from the Feminist Legal Clinic in Australia. Um, she is from Australia and she's, apart from a really significant feminist lawyer and uh, environmental activists and Green Party member, she's also the country contact for WDI Women's Declaration International in Australia. And she's going to talk um, a, sort of loosely on are women being watched, but around the theme that we're talking about today. So thank you so much for kind of coming, Anna. And um, over to you. Yeah, I, I sort of see ASIO spies everywhere, basically. That seems to be a problem I have. Um, for those not familiar with Australian conditions, ASIO is our um, uh, Australian security intelligence organisation. And here's a screen showing their office in Canberra. ASIO is just one of 10 agencies, actually, that make up Australia's national intelligence community. It apparently has an annual budget of about $2 billion and about 7,000 staff busy snooping, um, or at least that's what's publicly declared. Uh, so unlike our two previous speakers, yeah, I don't have a history of very significant um, activism that could be expected to attract surveillance. Um, I'm a very law-abiding character, but nevertheless, it's true. I would be somewhat crestfallen if I were to learn that I don't have an ASIO file. Back in 1993, on my first job in legal practice, as one of a dozen graduate solicitors with the Aboriginal Legal Service, we were assured during our orientation that we would all be automatically rewarded by having an ASIO file. And certainly I was just reading Indigenous activist Gary Foley, who, who was saying that ASIO does open files on those employed in many Aboriginal organisations. Um, I got that information from this book here, um, Dirty Secrets, Our ASIO Files, which was published in 2013 and contains essays by a number of eminent Australians with histories as activists um, who requested and analysed their ASIO files when they became available under Freedom of Information after 30 years. I understand it's now 20 years, but um, that certainly their files were heavily redacted. Um, however, it is clear from these essays that aside from an overriding preoccupation with the Australian Communist Party during those years, ASIO had a strong track record of infiltrating not only socialist and indigenous organizations, but also feminist groups. And Wendy Bacon, 
observes in her, she's an activist and journalist, and she observes in her essay um, that the women's liberation groups were under more surveillance than other groups that were just as radical in ideas and action. Wendy writes, we wondered if our groups were infiltrated by spies, but reassured ourselves that we were being overly paranoid. I know now that we were not being paranoid. Both ASIO and Special Branch had far more informants and agents than we ever suspected. So it's clear from this book that women then, just as now, dismissed their thoughts of being spied on as conspiracy theories um, or just plain paranoia. And, of course, women must always be careful to refrain from providing grounds for others to question their mental health because we know what a useful tool that is to men. Um, however, this book confirms that extensive spying on feminist groups did take place and there is no reason to think there aren't ASIO operatives still drawing salaries for simply saying for simply spying on women as they go about their business. Um, so the lessons of the past would indicate that surveillance of women's groups does, um, does take place even when they pose absolutely no threat. And reflecting on her ASIO file, Jean McLean writes, what does emerge, however, is how little of genuine importance there was for our agents to spy on, how small was our threat to security and how great the waste of money from a huge secret budget. All right, so despite all this being documented, there still seems to be very few women who take seriously the, the risk that we're being spied on, um, and let alone suspecting that we may be actively, um, have agents who are actively briefed to undermine women's sex-based rights. Uh, so, look, I seem to be unusual in that whenever I have a trouble with my mobile phone, I always make sure I blame ASIO just in case they're listening. And when my emails are slow coming through, I always attribute it to the slow readers they employ in Canberra. However, of course, my partner and children are very dismissive of the idea that anyone would be interested in tracking my activities. And in their view, all irregularities can be traced to my own incompetence. And they might have a point. Um, indeed, thinking about someone spying on you does seem to be very self-indulgent and egocentric. And women generally like to leave that kind of thinking to men. But um, I have to admit that it's true that the technology now available for eavesdropping is far more sophisticated than it used to be. And my partner, who's an IT professional, assures me that if ASIO were tapping my phone, it would be seamless and there would be no telltale clicks or other strange sounds to alert me to the fact. Um, nevertheless, I think there is a risk of overestimating the sophistication of those who are spying on us. I recall that early in my legal practice, when I was still with the Aboriginal Legal Service, I had a case of a woman who discovered an improbably huge listening device, very poorly sewn into the back of her sofa. Rather than being a discreet button, as you'd probably expect at that time, it was half the size of a shoebox. And when she started tampering with it, a whole bunch of police officers suddenly turned up on her doorstep. Although she had no criminal history or background in activism, it turned out they were bugging her because her brother had escaped from prison and they were trying to obtain information about his whereabouts. And the reason the listening device was so huge was that this all happened at the same time as the New South Wales Royal Commission into Police Corruption and all the usual listening devices were used up listening to corrupt police officers. So they had to use an old model, something like one of these Cold War models that I found a photo of. Um, so, yes, it's possible that the people uh, monitoring us are more like the Keystone cops rather than 007. So while it's important that we don't underestimate the scale of spying by national security agencies, it's also important that we don't frighten ourselves by overestimating the abilities of the individuals engaged in these activities. A colleague and veteran activist tells me that her master's thesis was on George Eliot, and when an associate of hers obtained their ASIO file, there were transcript from tapped phone conversations between them with comments in the margins um, by the ASIO agents questioning the identity of this person, George Elliott, who was under discussion. So I think, yes, we should be alert, very alert, but not necessarily quaking in our boots. And it's also important to acknowledge, um, it's also important to acknowledge how incompetence plays a role in sometimes derailing a campaign or movement. And I don't know if we've people, everybody's already seen this, this um, the simple sabotage field, field manual written in 1944 by CIA's precursor, the Office of Strategic Services, which details how purposeful stupidity 
can be used to derail organisations. And I think it's probably the fact that I read this some years ago. Um, that's probably more than anything else responsible for me seeing spies lurking in every meeting that I attend because so much of this behaviour um, is typical. Um, so the men in ASIO have created lots of busy work uh, spying on women. And I say men because the majority of special agents have always been male, although the numbers are beginning to equalise. However, it's difficult to be sure because it's likely that ASIO now counts as female, increasing numbers of men in dresses. And the idea of men posing as women to spy on them is by no means unprecedented. Uh, the um, famous French transgender spy Chevalier Dion successfully infiltrated the court of Empress Elizabeth of Russia by presenting as a woman. That was back in the 1700s, and he was a French diplomat, soldier, and spy for Louis XV and had androgynous physical characteristics. Dion actually claimed to have been born female and raised male and later obtained permission from the king to dress and live as a woman. However, after his death, it was discovered that he had fully intact, intact male genitals. And the term eonism was derived from his name and refers to the adoption of traditionally female dress and behaviour by a man. And the physician who coined the term wrote a description of it, which has a lot in common with the um, description given by Blanchard in, in um, formulating his uh, theory about autogynophilia. Uh, so recruitment of transgender spies seems to be in full swing. And um, I've personally encountered individuals in women's organisations whom I suspect on both counts, that is, I suspect them of being men and of being spies. Um, in at least one case, I've had my suspicions somewhat confirmed some years later. And, um, of course, not all spies and saboteurs uh, are necessarily government recruits. Um, they may be spies for other organisations or bodies. Um, about 10 years, ago, 10 years ago, I had the strange experience of volunteering for over a year in a woman's organisation, filling a shift with not just one, but often two fellow volunteers who were concealing their trans identity, making me unwittingly the only woman in the room. Um, I had my suspicions about one of them, but dismissed them at the time as too far-fetched because that was before my awareness of the trans activism that was the, my first, first encounter with it. More noteworthy to me at the time was that one of these individuals appeared to be actively undermining the continued viability of the organisation by filing debt notices from the tax office in the bin. And they also appeared to be organising the volunteer roster suboptimally to ensure regular closure of the service. So perhaps this was some of the purposeful stupidity uh, I read about earlier. This individual um, subsequently encouraged a younger woman who identified as a non-binary pansexual to campaign aggressively for the service to make constitutional changes to explicitly accommodate all individuals claiming to be women. I found myself fighting many battles while not really comprehending the, the hidden agenda. For example, their desire to promote a commercial hair removal service struck me as entirely inconsistent with feminist principles but of course, I was failing to apprehend the importance of this service for increasing members of our clientele. At one stage, I found minutes from one of their meetings left lying around. And so gradually, the nature of their intentions became more apparent to me. Uh, however, even considering the possibility of some wolves in sheep's clothing, I think we have to recognise the unhappy possibility that some of those spying on us within our groups are likely to be women that we all know and trust. And here are some pictures of women who have worked as Australian spies in the past, just to demonstrate that they don't all look like James Bond or drag queens. One particularly successful spy during the Cold War was the housewife Anne Neal, who's depicted here emerging from the People's Bookshop. Her activities on behalf of ASIO are described in the book Spies and Sparrows by Philip Deary. She was very successful gaining trust and infiltrating the Communist Party of Australia because of her natural veneer as a fluttery old lady. So Anne Summer writes in her essay about her ASIO file 
now that ASIO's files um, from those days are available, we can retrospectively say that our paranoia was justified. It is clear we considerably underestimated just how extensively we were being monitored. But in fact, it, isn't, it wasn't paranoia at all because paranoia is the irrational and persistent feeling that people are out to get you or that you are the subject of persistent intrusive attention by others. But it's not paranoia if the feeling is rational and reality-based. There is also another lesser known term taught to me by a friend who suffers from paranoid schizophrenia, and that term is pronoia. And pronoia is a word coined to describe a state of mind that is the opposite of paranoia. Whereas a person suffering from paranoia feels that persons or entities are conspiring against them, a person experiencing pronoia feels that the world around them conspires to do them good, even when there is evidence to the contrary. Pronoia, which is irrational and not reality-based, seems to be a widespread and undiagnosed problem among many women. And I would suggest that it's possibly a symptom of the Stockholm Syndrome. And as you'd be aware, uh, Stockholm Syndrome is a coping mechanism for those in captive or abusive situations where people develop positive feelings towards their captors or abusers over a period of time. It's quite apparent to me from my work in the domestic violence um, rosters in the Sydney local courts that Stockholm Syndrome is a widespread affliction among women. And most of us need to examine ourselves for these symptoms. Indeed, I'd suggest it exists on a societal-wide basis, and these affectionate feelings by women towards men are uh, an essential element in enabling the patriarchy to flourish. Uh, so, as I was saying, it's not paranoia if your feelings are rational and reality-based, no matter how outlandish it might sound. For example, I have an intrusive thought that men in high places dressed up as women are scheming against us and undermining the gains made by feminism uh, by insisting that men should have access to women's spaces, services and sports, and indeed by seeking to change the very definition of woman, while also indoctrinating our children and subjecting the most vulnerable to hormones and surgeries that will sterilise and maim them for life. That does sound pretty far-fetched, but as we can see from some of the characters on the screen, um, there are people who really are seem to be working at this. Uh, it also seems very far-fetched that many of these men who claim to always have felt they were women also choose careers in the armed forces before deciding to go public with their desire to change sex. Certainly in the United States, it's well documented that trans people are two to five times more likely than others to have served in the military. We are told this is because they are overcompensating for their failure to conform with masculine stereotypes or are seeking the financial security or belonging they are otherwise denied. Um, and for many, that seems to be an adequate rationale, but it, it still strikes me as a bit of a stretch. Um, so I don't know. A conspiracy theory is an explanation for an event or situation that invokes a conspiracy by sinister and powerful groups, often political in motivation, when other explanations are more probable. So I, I suppose some people would say that it's more probable that trans activism is a genuinely grassroots movement um, entirely propelled by a marginalised minority, many of whom just happen to have had military training and which just happens to have gripped the entire globe simultaneously, and that international philanthropic funds just happen to have altruistically embraced this ideology in perfect synchronicity to enable it to flourish, and, and furthermore, that any profits accruing to the pharmaceutical industry are purely incidental. So I guess that's something we all have to make our own personal judgments on what we think is most probable. Uh, a conspiracy is said to involve a secret plan by a group to do something unlawful or harmful. And certainly uh, some elements of this plan to erase women's sex-based rights are not entirely secret or unlawful, as is apparent by the existence of this publication put together by Denton's, which is one of the largest law firms in the world. And they put this together with, in collaboration with multinational media conglomerate Thomson Reuters. However, while not necessarily secret, many of the mechanisms employed are intentionally opaque to members of the public. This publication specifically advocates that NGOs campaigning for legal gender recognition should avoid excessive press coverage and exposure, suggesting instead that activists lobby youth politicians to keep press coverage to a minimum and work within the party to persuade more senior politicians. 
Other manipulative strategies are also suggested, including tying the campaign to more popular reforms such as marriage equality. Uh, people are, are largely unaware of how public and private governance and the media are being manipulated by the powerful trans lobby and the mechanisms by which this, by which this is being achieved. For example, most Australians are oblivious to the role played by the AIDS Council of New South Wales, ACOM, in operating the Australian Workplace Equality Index, which is Australia's answer to Stonewall's Diversity Champions Program. This project was launched in 2010 um, at the offices of the Australian Federal Police, who were a founding partner and who have continued to play a very active role in its promotion. Uh, it wouldn't be fair to say the history of any of this is secretive because it has been very nicely documented by a professor at the Australian Catholic University who also happens to have um, background writing military history. So even within political parties, few women seem to consider that some individuals may be uh, infiltrators with a hidden agenda. For example, as a long-term member of the New South Wales Greens, I was able to observe how the agenda for the Women's Working Group was actively derailed by a succession of males identifying as trans. One young man identifying as a trans woman intervened in an email exchange about the campaign to decriminalise abortion. He made the following contribution to the discussion in which he carefully transplains that abortion is not a women's issue. Uh, I don't know if I'll read all this to you. Um, he just sort of very kindly says, just a reminder to everyone that there are plenty of people who don't identify as a woman who need abortions and framing it as a women's issue and essentializing body bodies is a large criticism of second wave feminism. Very simply, it's not just about gender, it's about having a uterus, blah, blah, blah. And I like the way also it puts in intersectionality is the key here for the abortion campaign and all other campaigns we decide to run. I'm not familiar with intersectionality. Um, if you are not familiar with intersectionality, have a quick Google of intersectional feminism. So here's a, a young man schooling a, um, a group of women, you know, political activists in, in the language that they should use and the ideo ideology they should adopt. And rather than being ignored or, or met with some kind of humorous rebuke, there was an awkward gap. And then one woman responded saying he raises good points. And another one was um, somewhat op apologetic. No doubt encouraged by this, he sent further emails in the following weeks that continued to school the women in appropriate language and rebu rebuke them for any non-compliance. I found it all very extraordinary to behold and dem it demonstrated to me for the first time that trans ideology could effectively derail feminist activity and pose a considerable threat to our ability to politically organise. This same individual who was a student activist subsequently moved to the Labor Party before being exposed as a traitor to students and the left. Um, that's a quote from some minutes from the, the student body at the time because he'd been found to have been working with young liberals the other political party. Um, a few years later, that same women's working group went on to elect as their co-convener another physiologically intact, intact male identifying as a trans woman. His appointment was met with gushing acclaim by many, while many other women silently unsubscribed from the mailing list. With very few exceptions, women chose to keep silent or loudly embraced his election. This individual has since disappeared and is apparently no longer in contact with even some of the women who were his strongest supporters. Now, even the fact that this individual maintained his male persona for business purposes, and I later was able to reveal that he was also a contractor with the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission, none of that incited anyone to question his bona fides. So clearly, um, other women are far more trusting than me. Uh, so this brings me to my reflection on women's intuition as being rather overrated. Um, it's often occurred to me that women's intuition describes a situation where a woman finally admits to herself an obvious truth about a man or men generally. It's as if her subconscious finally leaks into her willing, her unwilling consciousness. An obvious example being wives and girlfriends who are often the last to know about their partner's infidelity. And yeah, that's a topic for another day. But for present purposes, the glaring example is the failure of women, not so much failing to detect the presence of men dressed as women, but their failure to question their bona fides. And I think this takes us back to the whole concept of pro noia and the Stockholm syndrome. If, re if women really have a knack for knowing what others are feeling and thinking, how is it possible that they have welcomed and embraced as women, men who quite obviously have motivations that threaten the safety and well-being of women and children? It's also noteworthy to me that um, 
this individual's running mate um, who shared the position as co-convener with him at the time uh, was a woman with an incongruous corporate background and has since been elected and works tirelessly to amend legislation to remove all mention of women and mothers. Um, so when I expressed my concern about these efforts in a quote to the media, she responded by making a complaint against me, which has resulted in my recent expulsion from that party. So unfortunately, I think it is um, clear that spies uh, do more than just control, collect information, but they also act as saboteurs. And I think once an organisation has been infiltrated, it's only too easy to manipulate its activities. And I note that the Victorian Greens recently removed a democratically elected convener following a furore on social media during which she was accused of transphobia. The social media pylon seemed quite disparate from the democratic process that had just taken place, but was still successful in overturning the results of the election. So, of course, a lot of surveillance, infiltration and manipulation is now taking place online through social media. And I've, I've observed that those of us who do not maintain active Facebook or Twitter accounts um, are somewhat more impervious to attack than those who are active keyboard warriors and who tend to attract pylons of abusive posts. Um, so even after our exposure in mainstream media for being evicted for allegedly anti-trans material, Feminist Legal Clinic received only supportive messages and donations. But others active in this space um, have reported similar experiences, which makes me speculate whether a great deal of the abuse isn't being generated by a small handful of paid individuals supported by a large number of Twitter bots. It's also interesting to note that Twitter actively recruits FBI agents and spies onto its staff. Um, one study, of course, estimates that about a quarter of all tweets are generated by Twitter bots, and hopefully Elon Musk will extract further confirmation of this in his upcoming court case against Twitter. A key advantage of Twitter bots and other automated systems is the ability to both target an audience and provide an effective level of repetition. Nazi propagandist Joseph Goebbels observed that it would not be impossible to prove with sufficient repetition and psychological understanding of the people concerned that a square is in fact a circle, in other words, the bigger the line, the more people believe it. And certainly using this methodology, it seems to have been possible to convince the large sections of the population that men are indeed women. Um, so I just, to finish, just to say, look, women um, must need, must give themselves credit that we pose a bigger threat than our modest natures would allow. I mean, just imagine what would happen if women just stopped dismissing each other as nutcases and liars and took each other seriously instead of giving credibility to the many men working to manipulate us. Imagine if we instead ignored or laughed at men as they do at us, as is usually attributed to Gandhi, but was no doubt first said by some wise woman, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. So for those of us engaged in actively fighting them, whether by protesting in the streets, on social media or in the courts, remember that this is already the last step before victory. It is getting harder and harder for them to ignore and dismiss our voices in opposition, and we are getting traction. And in the meantime, we've just got to be vigilant not to succumb to their clandestine efforts to sabotage our organisations from within.